Okay, thank you. And thank you to the organizers for the invitation to speak here. I'm going to talk about how lambda coalescence can arise in a population model involving dormancy. I'll begin by introducing the classical Wright Fisher model and Kingman's coalescent. Uh, then I'll review some known results about coalescence with multiple mergers uh, or lambda coalescence, which I hope will be useful to those of you who are uh, new to this area. And then I'll describe our population model in which individuals can periodically enter a dormant state. And finally, I'll, I'll state our results indicating that coalescence with multiple mergers can sometimes describe the genealogy of this population. So let's begin uh, with the Wright-Fisher model, uh, which was introduced by Fisher in 1921 and Wright in 1930. We assume that the population has fixed size n. This is a discrete time model and generations do not overlap. Each individual has one parent in the previous generation. And we say that each individual independently chooses its parent uniformly at random from the individuals in the previous generation. Now we're going to be interested in understanding the genealogical structure of populations. So that means we want to imagine taking a sample of individuals from the population at some time and following their ancestral lines backwards in time. So for the moment, let's just imagine sampling two individuals from the Wright-Fisher model in generation zero, because they choose their parents uh, independently and uniformly at random, the probability that they choose the same parent is one over N, and therefore the probability that they choose different parents is one minus one over N. So if we let T be the number of generations that we have to go back until these individuals have a common ancestor, the probability that T is greater than N times X is the probability that the two individuals choose different parents N times X generations in a row. So that's one minus one over N to the power N times X, which is approximately E to the X. So we see that the distribution of T over N is approximately exponential with rate one. And what this calculation suggests is that if we take a sample of lowercase n individuals from the Wright-Fisher model and trace back their ancestral lines, the genealogy should be described by a process called Kingman's coalescent, in which uh, each pair of lineages merges at rate one. Uh, Kingman's coalescent was introduced in 1982. Formally, it's a continuous time Markov chain that takes its values in the set of partitions of the integers one through n. It starts out at time zero from the partition of the integers one through n into singletons. And then uh, as time goes forward, uh, each possible transition that involves uh, two of the blocks of the partition merging into one happens at rate one. And those are the only allowable transitions. So if at some time the partition has k blocks, there are k choose two possible transitions because there are k choose two pairs of blocks that could merge together. So the time that we have to wait until the next merger is exponentially distributed with a rate of k choose two. And then at, at that time, we pick two blocks of the partition at random and merge them together. And so here is a picture of uh, Kingman's coalescent started with a sample of uh, five individuals. As we trace back the ancestral lines, first lineages four and five merge, then one and two merge, then three merges with four and five. And finally, the last two lineages merge. And at that point, the entire sample has been traced back to one common ancestor. And notice that one time unit on the Kingman's coalescent time scale is corresponding here to n generations in the Wright-Fisher model. And so here is a precise limit theorem. Uh, suppose we have a population that evolves according to the Wright-Fisher model with a population of size capital N. We sample lowercase n individuals at random in generation zero. And then we can define these ancestral processes that describe what happens as we follow the ancestral lines backwards in time. So psi n of k will be the partition of the integers one through n, such that uh, the integers i and j are in the same block of the partition, if and only if the ith and jth individuals in the sample have the same ancestor in generation minus k. So blocks of the partition correspond to groups of individuals that have the same ancestor when we look k generations back in time. 
And then uh, as the population size n tends to infinity, these ancestral processes with time sped up by a factor of n converge to Kingman's coalescence, where here by convergence, I mean the weak convergence of stochastic processes with respect to the Skorohod topology. Now, Kingman's coalescent describes the genealogy of populations under a wide range of circumstances. But in other circumstances, one needs to consider a larger class of coalescent processes known as uh, coalescence with multiple mergers or lambda coalescence. And these processes were introduced independently in 1999 by Pittman and Sagitov, and also appeared around the same time in work of Donnelly and Kurtz. And these coalescent processes have the property that more than two ancestral lines can merge at a time. So we could get a picture like this one, where lineages one through four all merge at the same time, and then later the last lineage joins them. Now, when might the genealogy of a population look like this? Well, one possibility is when we have a population with large family sizes. In that case, many ancestral lines could be traced back to one individual that had an unusually large number of offspring. A second possibility is natural selection. If a beneficial mutation appears on one individual, it could rapidly spread to a significant fraction of the population. And then many ancestral lines could be traced back to the one individual that acquired the beneficial mutation, and they could merge at approximately the same time. And we're going to see later that in some circumstances, dormancy could also produce a genealogy that's best described by a lambda coalescent. So I want to define now what the lambda coalescent is. Here, lambda is a finite measure on the unit interval. And then the lambda coalescent is a continuous time Markov chain taking its values in the set of partitions of the integers one through n. And it's defined by the property that whenever the partition has b blocks, each possible transition that involves k of the blocks merging into one is happening at a rate given by this integral. And these are the only allowable transitions. Now, the best way to understand the lambda coalescent is to see how to construct it from a Poisson point process. We can write the measure lambda as the sum of an atom at zero plus some other measure lambda zero, which assigns no mass to zero. And then in the lambda coalescent, we have two types of transitions. Uh, each uh, pair of lineages is merging at rate A. And then separately, we have larger mergers that occur at times of a Poisson point process on the positive reals cross zero one. The intensity measure in the time coordinate is Lebesgue measure so that the process is homogeneous in time. And in the uh, second coordinate, the intensity is uh, absolutely continuous with respect to lambda zero, but with this extra factor of P to the minus two. And then if T comma P is a point of this Poisson process, we have a so-called P merger occurring at time T. So that means we flip an independent coin for each lineage, which comes up heads with probability P, and we merge all of the lineages whose coins come up heads. And from that description, uh, we can see where this formula for the transition rates is coming from. We have P mergers at the rate P to the minus two lambda DP, and then at the time a P merger occurs, the probability that a particular set of K blocks merges into one is P to the K times one minus P to the B minus K. So now I wanna introduce a larger collection of population models. Uh, they're known as Canning's models and they were introduced by Canning's in 1974. So as in the Wright-Fisher model, we assume that the population has fixed size N and we're working in discrete time with generations that don't overlap. But now we're going to let nu 1n through nu nn denote the numbers of offspring of the n individuals in some generation. And we're only going to assume that the distribution of this vector of family sizes is exchangeable so that there's no significance to the order in which the individuals are listed. And we'll also assume that the, these family size vectors in different generations are independent and identically distributed. So now as in the Wright-Fisher model, we can define the ancestral process that 
represents the genealogy of the population in a Canning's model. Uh, we sample n individuals from generation zero, and then we define psi n of k to be the partition of one through n, such that i and j are in the same block of the partition, if and only if the ith and jth sampled individuals have the same ancestor in generation minus k. One can work out the probability that two individuals in a Canning's model have the same parent. We'll denote that by Cn, and it's given by this expression here. Uh, notice I'm using this falling factorial notation. So this expression inside the expectation is nu 1n times nu 1n minus 1. Now there's a theorem of Martin Merle, which says that uh, as long as this condition here is satisfied, the genealogy of the Canning's model converges to Kingman's coalescence. So this condition here is really saying that the probability that three randomly chosen individuals in some generation all have the same parent is small relative to the probability that two randomly chosen individuals have the same parent. And so that's naturally a condition under which we would expect to see only pairwise mergers of ancestral lines. Also notice that the time scaling here by CN is a very natural time scale because CN is the probability that two individuals have the same parent. So when we scale time by CN, we're setting it up so that the rate at which two given lineages merge, uh, or, or rather the expected time before two lineages merge is equal to one. Now under, uh, under other circumstances where this limit is not equal to zero, it's possible to see multiple mergers of ancestral lines in the limit. And there's a nice tool available which uh, allows us to prove convergence of the genealogy to a lambda coalescence in a Canning's model. And it's, it's this theorem here, which is very close to a theorem in Sajitov's paper, uh, but also incorporates some ideas from this paper of Merla and Sajitov. So this first condition simply says that the probability that two individuals have the same parent is small. The second condition says that it's unlikely that two different groups of ancestral lines are going to merge in the same generation. And the most important condition is this third condition, which says that the probability that the uh, number of offspring of one individual in the next generation is greater than n times x, scaled by n over cn, is converging to the integral from x to one of y to the minus two lambda dy. And this condition should make sense if you think about the Poisson process construction of the lambda coalescence. This expression on the right-hand side uh, is the rate of p mergers with p greater than or equal to x. And so that should naturally be connected to the probability that one individual is, is giving birth to more than a fraction X of the population in the next generation. And when these three conditions are satisfied, these ancestral processes do in fact converge to the lambda coalescence. Now I wanna give one specific example where the genealogies in a Canning's model converge to the lambda coalescence, and this will end up being an important example later on. So we're gonna consider uh, a population model with a heavy tailed offspring distribution. Uh, so again, population has fixed size N, we have non-overlapping generations. The numbers of offspring of the N individuals in a generation are IID random variables uh, taking positive integers as values. And we'll assume that the probability that an individual has K or more offspring is asymptotically a constant times K to the minus alpha where alpha is positive. And then we obtain the next generation by sampling capital N of these offspring without replacement. So that will keep the population size fixed. And this could be at least somewhat realistic if the environment can only support a population of a certain size. Uh, this is an example of a Kennings model. And so we can take a sample of N individuals from generation zero and define the ancestral processes as before. So we wanna take the population size to infinity and consider what we get for these uh, ancestral processes in the limit. And here is the theorem that describes the limiting behavior. So when alpha is greater than or equal to two, large families are sufficiently rare 
that the genealogy of the population converges to Kingman's coalescence. However, when alpha is between one and two, uh, the offspring distribution has heavier tails and we do see uh, some uh, very large families and the genealogy of the population converges to the beta coalescence. That is the lambda coalescence where lambda is the beta distribution with parameters two minus alpha and alpha. When alpha is equal to one, the beta one one distribution is uniform on zero one and the associated lambda coalescence is known as the bolthausen snitman coalescence. And if alpha is between zero and one, this is sort of a different kind of case because we have multiple large families in every generation and the ancestral processes will converge to a discrete time coalescent process. It's also instructive to think about what's happening to the time scaling here. When alpha is greater than two so that the offspring distribution has finite variance, the probability that two individuals have the same parent is asymptotically sigma squared over n where sigma squared is the variance of the number of offspring of one individual that survive. And so in order to get a non-trivial limit, we need to speed up time by a factor which is of order n, just as in the right Fisher model. When alpha is between one and two, uh, uh, large families happen more often. So individuals are more likely to have the same parent and we only have to speed up time by n to the alpha minus one. When alpha is equal to one, large families happen even more often, and we only have to speed up time by log n because the probability that two individuals have the same parent is asymptotically one over log n. And so finally, I want to explain why it is that beta coalescence arise in this model. And I'm going to focus on the case where alpha is strictly between one and two, so that the offspring distribution has some finite mean mu. Now, by the law of large numbers, the n individuals should produce approximately n times mu offspring in the next generation. And therefore, if one individual produces psi offspring, the fraction of the population in the next generation for which this individual is responsible should be approximately psi over psi plus n times mu. And if this fraction is equal to p, then when we trace ancestral lines backwards in time, we should see a p merger at the time of this event as roughly a fraction p of the ancestral lines merge together. So we should see a p merger with p greater than or equal to x whenever psi over psi plus n times mu is bigger than or equal to x, or equivalently, if psi is greater than or equal to x over one minus x times n mu. Now we can calculate the probability that we see a family this large in a given generation. It's simply the number of individuals n multiplied by the probability that a particular individual has at least this many offspring, which by our assumption is a constant times this number to the minus alpha power. Now we can also calculate in the beta coalescence, the rate of P mergers with P greater than or equal to X. So remember that in the lambda coalescence, we have P mergers at the rate P to the minus two lambda DP. So to find the rate of P mergers with P greater than or equal to X in the beta coalescence, we integrate P to the minus two times the beta density from X to one. And if you just evaluate this integral, uh, we again get an expression that's proportional to X over one minus X to the minus alpha. And that's why after a suitable time change, the beta coalescent describes the genealogy in this model. All right, so now I wanna move on to populations involving dormancy. And the idea behind our work originated uh, with an idea in this paper of Wright and Vestigian. So it's well known that in many uh, populations, individuals will periodically enter a dormant state, often in response to unfavorable environmental conditions. So mammals that hibernate in the winter would be one very familiar example of dormancy, uh, but many bacterial populations are also known to be able to enter a dormant state. And when an individual is in a dormant state, it's unable to reproduce. And Wright and Vestigian postulated that the randomness in the times when, uh, when individuals emerge from a dormant state could lead to a heavy tailed offspring distribution. 
The idea being that individuals that emerge earlier from dormancy have more time to produce offspring and therefore could end up with more descendants. And indeed, they say that they found in their bacterial experiments that, quote, the heavy tailed nature of the distribution of descendants can, in our case, be largely explained by phenotypic variability in lag time before exponential growth. So our goal was to formulate a population model that incorporates this behavior, and more precisely to investigate whether in extreme cases, dormancy could give rise to a genealogy uh, in which we have uh, multiple mergers of ancestral lines. The idea being that many ancestral lines could be traced back to one individual that emerges unusually early from dormancy. So here's the population model that we're going to consider. So we begin each year at time zero with capital N individuals, all of which are dormant. And then each year lasts for time TN, which is deterministic. And each year consists of three phases, which we call spring, summer, and winter. So the spring lasts for time little tn. Uh, and so uh, we begin with the spring. So each individual wakes up at some time between zero and tn. And the times at which the individuals wake up from dormancy are assumed to be IID random variables. And then once an individual is awake, it reproduces at rate lambda sub n as in a Yule process. So in other words, each individual gives birth at rate lambda n per unit time, and it gives birth to only one uh, offspring at a time. During the summer period, which lasts for time uh, between times little tn and capital tn, all of the individuals are awake and they're reproducing at rate lambda sub n. And then we have the winter, which is modeled here as consisting of just a single time point. So when the winter arrives, all individuals uh, simultaneously enter a dormant state. And then we choose uh, capital N individuals at random to survive the winter uh, and then uh, be alive at the start of the next year. And all other individuals die during the winter. So that keeps the size of the population fixed. Now, if we think of each year as being like one generation, this is in fact an instance of a Canning's model. And so we can define the genealogy of the population by sampling, let's say, lowercase n individuals at the beginning of year zero, and then defining psi n of k to be the partition of one through n, whose blocks correspond to groups of individuals that have the same ancestor at the beginning of the year minus k. So now I'm going to begin by considering a simple example in which every individual wakes up from dormancy either at the beginning or at the end of the spring. So we're gonna let tau i n be the time when the ith individual wakes up from dormancy. We're going to assume here that there's no summer period. So capital T n and little t n are the same. And we'll assume that, uh, that uh, individuals wake up at the beginning of the spring with probability omega n and at the end of the spring with probability one minus omega n. And we'll also assume that n times omega n is going to zero. So that means that in a typical generation, no individuals will wake up at the beginning of the spring. It's a rare event. Now, if an individual does wake up from dormancy at time zero, then for time tn, this individual is reproducing as in a Yule process. And therefore its expected number of descendants alive at time uh, tn will be e to the power lambda n times tn. And furthermore, we know that the Yule process has an exponential limit law. So we can approximate the number of descendants of this individual by w times e to the lambda n times tn, where w has an exponential distribution with rate one. Now suppose lambda n times tn is equal to the log of kappa n. So then this quantity here simply equals kappa times w times n. And then there will also be n minus one individuals that emerge from dormancy at the end of the spring. 
And so the fraction of the population that will be descended from the individual that wakes up early from dormancy will be approximately this random variable y kappa, which is defined to be kappa times w divided by kappa times w plus one. So here is our result about the genealogy of the population in this case. We're going to assume that lambda n times tn is equal to beta times the log of capital N. So that will ensure that if an individual wakes up early from dormancy, its number of descendants at the end of the spring should be of the order n to the beta. Now, if beta is greater than one, then that means that at the end of the spring, nearly the entire population is descended from the one individual that emerged early from dormancy. And so in this case, the ancestral processes converge to the so-called star-shaped coalescent, which is a trivial example of a lambda coalescent where lambda is simply a unit mass at one. So in this coalescent process, all of the lineages simultaneously merge after an exponentially distributed time with rate one. Now, if beta is equal to one, then we've seen that the fraction of the, uh, of the population that is descended from the individual that emerged unusually early from dormancy is described by the random variable y kappa. And it turns out that the genealogy converges to the lambda kappa coalescent, where lambda kappa is the probability measure that is characterized by this formula here. So remember from the Poisson process construction that y to the minus two lambda kappa dy is the rate of uh, the, the rate of y mergers, or in other words, the rate of mergers in which a fraction y of the lineages coalesce. So naturally that should be proportional to the probability that the random variable y kappa is in little dy. And this factor of one over the expected value of y kappa squared is just a scaling so that the measure uh, lambda kappa is a probability measure. Now, if beta is less than one, then if an individual wakes up early from dormancy, it will still have many descendants alive at the end of the spring. However, that, those descendants will still constitute a relatively small fraction of the total population. So we will not see uh, multiple mergers of ancestral lines and these, uh, these uh, ancestral processes will converge as n goes to infinity to Kingman's coalescence. We can also calculate the probability that two individuals uh, have the same parent. When beta is greater than one, this is simply, uh, it's asymptotically n times omega n, which is approximately the probability that there is an individual that wakes up early from dormancy. When beta is equal to one, we have to multiply that by the probability that if an individual wakes up early from dormancy, both of the sampled individuals are coming from that family. And that's the expected value of y kappa squared. And then there's a different scaling when beta is less than one. So now I wanna consider perhaps a slightly more realistic variation of the model in which the rate at which individuals emerge from dormancy is exponentially increasing over time. So we'll again assume that there's no summer period. So capital TN and little TN are the same. And then we're going to assume that the log of N over TN is going to zero. That just ensures that the spring period is long enough that individuals that wake up early from dormancy have time to produce a large number of offspring. And we're going to assume that the uh, that the reproduction rate lambda n is the same for all n, and so we're just going to denote it by lambda. So now we're going to consider these iid random variables zeta sub i, and these random variables are going to represent the time, the amount of time before the end of the spring that the individual emerged from dormancy, except that we have to truncate it at capital TN uh, because this can't be longer than the length of the spring. And then we're going to assume that the probability that zeta i is greater than y is asymptotically a constant times e to the minus gamma y as y tends to infinity. And so this condition is ensuring that the rate of exit from dormancy is 
exponentially increasing over time. So what happens in this case? So we're going to let x i n be the number of descendants of the ith individual at the end of the spring. Now, if zeta i is equal to u, uh, that means that the ith individual emerges from dormancy, u time units before the end of the spring, and it's going to evolve as a Yule process for time u. And therefore, x i n will have a geometric distribution with parameter e to the minus lambda times u. Now, to simplify the calculation, I just want to assume for now that the distribution of zeta i is exactly exponential with rate gamma. And so then to find the probability that a particular individual has more than k descendants alive at the end of the spring, we will integrate against the exponential density to find the value of u. And then we will also multiply this by the probability that this geometric random variable is greater than k, which is one minus e to the minus lambda u to the power k. And if we let alpha be gamma over lambda and evaluate this integral, we just get this expression here involving gamma functions. And this is asymptotically gamma of alpha plus one times k to the minus alpha as k goes to infinity. So the probability that an individual has k or more descendants alive at the end of the spring is asymptotically a constant times k to the minus alpha. And we've already seen how to describe the genealogy in a Canning's model that has this form. And so we just need to carry over that result to the present setting. And so here is our result for the genealogy of the population. It uh, applies under the conditions that we laid out on the previous slide, uh, again, with alpha being equal to gamma over lambda. So if alpha is greater than or equal to two, most individuals are emerging from dormancy very late in the spring. We don't see large families and the ancestral processes converge to Kingman's coalescence. If alpha is between one and two, then large families happen more often and the genealogy converges to the uh, lambda coalescence where lambda is the beta distribution with parameters two minus alpha and alpha. When alpha is between one and two, we have to wait order n to the alpha minus one years between these multiple mergers. And when alpha is equal to one, there are order log n years between multiple mergers. And if alpha is between zero and one, we're in this case where we converge to a discrete time coalescent process because there are multiple large families in every generation. So we've looked at two different instances of our more general model. And we've seen that in both cases, in some circumstances, the genealogy is described by the lambda coalescence. So it's natural to ask then whether we can characterize all possible lambda coalescence that could be obtained, uh, that, that, that could arise as the limit of the genealogy in our more general model. And it turns out that we can do this. And that's the content of this theorem. Uh, the, the measures lambda that we can get are precisely those that can be expressed as the sum of an atom at zero, an atom at one, and some other measure lambda prime, whose density can be expressed in this form where lambda is a measure satisfying this integrability condition. Now, this condition probably looks rather mysterious at first, but it's based on a fairly simple idea. So recall that in the first example we considered, the distribution of the time when an individual emerges from dormancy was concentrated at two points, at the beginning and at the end of the spring. So if the individual emerges early from dormancy, then it had to wake up at a fixed time. And we saw that the genealogy was given by a lambda kappa coalescent. So in the general case, it's possible that an individual that wakes up early from dormancy could wake up at a random time. And so the genealogy could be a mixture of lambda kappa coalescence. And that's really what this condition is saying. So recall that we had this random variable y kappa that could be expressed easily in terms of an exponential random variable. 
and y to the minus two lambda kappa dy could be written in uh, this form. It was proportional to the probability that y kappa is in little dy. So this integrand here turns out to be simply y squared multiplied by the probability density function of y kappa. So we can write the integrand in this form. And then from this expression, we can see that we can rewrite this integrand as lambda kappa dy times this expectation. And so lambda prime is really a mixture of the, uh, of the probability measures lambda kappa. Eta is the mixing measure. And this integrability condition is just telling us uh, that that's just the condition that ensures that the measure lambda prime is a finite measure. Now, in both of the special cases of the model that we considered in detail, there was no summer period. And the reason for that is that the summer typically does not affect the genealogy of the population. And here is, is a, a simple theorem to that effect. So suppose that for a model in which there is no summer, the ancestral processes converge to some lambda coalescence. So then as before, we'll let xin denote the number of descendants at the, of the ith individual at the beginning of the year uh, that are alive at the end of the spring. And then if this condition holds, if this limit is equal to zero, then we will get the same limiting genealogy if we add a summer of any length to the model. So why is this true? Well, recall that CN essentially by definition is the probability that two randomly chosen lineages will coalesce during the spring period. Now, if there are capital M individuals alive at the end of the spring, then during the summer, those M families are going to evolve as in a Yule process. And so the probability that two randomly chosen lineages coalesce during the summer is precisely the probability that those two lineages are sampled from the same one of these M families. And the probability of that is going to be of order one over M. And so this condition here is simply saying that the probability of coalescence during the summer is much smaller than the probability of coalescence during the spring. And naturally under that condition, the summer will not affect the genealogy of the population. If this condition fails to hold, then it is possible to get additional pairwise mergers of ancestral lines during the summer. So to summarize, we know that in many populations, individuals periodically enter a dormant state. We've seen that individuals that emerge unusually early from dormancy may be able to produce substantially more descendants than other individuals. And we've seen that in sufficiently extreme cases, this could uh, lead to lambda coalescent genealogies in which many ancestral lines get traced back to one individual that emerged unusually early from dormancy, producing these multiple mergers of ancestral lines. However, I wanna be careful not to oversell this point because Wright and Vestigian uh, did write, quote, it is unlikely that the variance diverges with population size for the particular species and conditions we examined. Now, if the variance stays bounded as a function of the population size, then it is Kingman's coalescent rather than, a, rather than a lambda coalescent that should describe the genealogy. And so at the moment, we are not aware of any actual biological populations whose genealogy should be given by a lambda coalescent as a result of dormancy. And I'll stop there, thank you.